Okay, so now that we've done some uh, causes of the Civil War, we're going to get into the Civil War itself. Um, we're going to do a number of videos that cover everything from Bull Run right to Appomattox Courthouse and then the assassination of Lincoln. This is what the United States uh, looked like in 1861 at the beginning of the Civil War. And you can see in the gray, that's what the Confederacy was made up of. And in the blue, that would be the Union. But you also have to include these four border states. So Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri were considered the border states that were very important because they still had slaves, but they were on the side of the Union. They weren't looking to secede. One of the things that Lincoln was going to have to do was to hold on to them uh, with anything that he could, which is also another one of the reasons why he felt like he couldn't just get rid of slavery right away. If he tried to abolish slavery, they would have seceded, and there's a, a very good chance that Confederacy would have won the war. Now, like in any war, one of the main objectives usually is to get the capital city. Um, if two countries are fighting and they can take the capital city of the other, that's kind of checkmate for them. In this case, something very odd about this, because the capital of the Union was right on the border of the Confederacy. And one of the dangers was that if Maryland were to secede, the capital of the Union would be totally surrounded by Confederate territory. On the other hand, the new Confederate capital was Richmond, Virginia. They literally were 100 miles away from each other. So you would have thought that one side or the other could probably kind of easily take over the, you know, the capital city. And they couldn't. This was one of the worst places to fight. This is one of the most fiercest places to fight throughout the entire Civil War. After the attack on Fort Sumter, Lincoln wanted his army to attack the Confederacy right away. He felt like they had a number of advantages, especially with uh, a larger military and you know, a lot of people. So to attack right away may have put the Confederacy on the defensive, and that's what, what he was hoping to do. This gave General Irvin McDowell only a few days to get an army ready, and that was just not enough time. The first target was called a small town, uh, was a small town called Manassas. It was an important railroad junction between DC and Richmond and a stream called Bull Run ran through it. So looking at the map here, you can see that the Union Army leaving DC went on a straight path towards Richmond. But one of the problems is that the Union Army was so undisciplined which we're going to get to in a second, that it took them too long and it gave the Confederacy a chance to build up their, uh, their power against them. So if we go up here, Union troops were very undisciplined and McDowell had a hard time getting them to move quickly to the point where they, they literally were just picking berries along the side of the road. And what should have taken just maybe a, a few days took much longer. The slowness of the Union Army allowed Confederate troops led by PGT Beauregard to head them off at Manassas, also known as Bull Run. So to st set the, sta the stage for the battle, um, to give you an idea what people were expecting, the Union really did believe, or many in the Union believed that this, this war could take a week and that it would just be over. Um, to the point where when people heard rumors that there might be a battle at Manassas, they made picnic lunches. They showed up to sit up on the hills and to watch the battle, kind of like going to the movies on a Sunday. Um, they thought it might be an, a nice form of entertainment and the, the war would be over before they knew it. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Union troops were winning, but then they were turned back by Stonewall Jackson, one of Robert E. Lee's main generals. When new Confederate troops arrived, the Union retreated back in panic to DC. And the Confederates did not chase because they were so exhausted, which was good for the Union at that point. If the Confederates had enough to chase after them, they may very well have been able to take DC that day. While the Union was retreating, they ran through a crowd of the sightseers and the picnic people as they retreated. This showed that the Civil War was going to be a long fight it was not gonna be the quick fight that many thought it would be.
in this first battle, both the Union and the Confederacy suffered many casualties. Um, by the time this war is over, both the Union and the Confederacy combined will have lost more American lives than almost all the other major wars combined. So that includes the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and even into the Persian Gulf. If you take all of the, the casualties combined from those wars and you stack it up against the Civil War, the Civil War still wins. So a casualty is anyone who has been killed, injured, captured, or missing in a war. In essence, if a person can no longer fight for your side, they're a casualty. Now, if also going into this, the Union and the Confederacy each had their strengths and their weaknesses. On paper, the Union looked much stronger. First of all, they had twice as much railroad as the South, and a big reason for that was because of the amount of industry that the North had while the South was agricultural. And they also had twice as many factories for the same reason. So if they needed supplies, they needed uniforms, they needed guns, they needed bullets, they could crank them out and they would have railroads to get them to the armies when needed. The Union also had a balanced economy between agriculture and industry. So as much industry as we had in the North, we did have farms. I mean, you can see it here even in Uxbridge, uh, you know, this far north into Massachusetts, we do have farms here. They don't get to go uh, as long as farms in the South because the soil is different, the weather is different, the temperature is different and so on. But we do have agriculture here that we could rely on. We had more money in the bank. And maybe most important, we had a functioning government. DC was already established. Congress was already there. We had a president. Everything was already, already to go where the Confederacy had to build from scratch. We also had two thirds of the population living in the North. Now, as far as the Confederate advantages, it doesn't look like much, but when this war gets going, we are going to see what an advantage that was for them. They had the nation's best trained officers. They only had to fight a defensive war, meaning that they didn't have to go on the attack. Now that's also a negative to them because if they're fighting a defensive war, that means a lot of the fighting is happening on their soil. It's happening where their homes are. For the North, they were fighting away from home. So that was good in that their homes weren't getting destroyed, but it also meant that maybe they didn't know the land as well. And the Confederates had a cause. They were fighting for a way of life. They felt the, the federal government was taking something away from them. And they felt like this was something worth saving because without slavery and telling the federal government that they couldn't tell them what to do was a way of life. So again, with any war, both sides are going to have to come up with some kind of plan. Uh, how are you going to go about taking on the enemy? What's your best course of action? You take all your advantages and disadvantages together and you come up with the plan that you think will, will work best for you. The Union strategy to defeat the Confederacy was called the Anaconda Plan, named after the snake. And with an anaconda, the way that it kills its prey is that it, it wraps itself around the prey and crushes it to death, and then it eats it. So that's what the Union was looking to do to the Confederacy, was to crush it, to wrap itself around it and crush it the best way it could. So first on the plan was a blockade. You can see these blue dots along the map here. We would set up our Navy because we had a pretty strong Navy at that point where the Confederacy had very little Navy and we would blockade the coast. So nothing from Great Britain could go in or out. For example, the British relied on Southern cotton. Well, now that cotton couldn't get out. The British would have to look elsewhere and the South would have all this cotton sitting there rotting away and they wouldn't make any money. The Confederate, I'm sorry, the Union also would use gunboats and troops to take over the Mississippi River. So that's over here. So a combination of gunboats that can uh, sit on the river where it wasn't as deep as the ocean. And you also use troops to move by, by land to take over any number of places. If you can take over the Mississippi River, you now have cut the Confederacy into two parts. And then of course, target Richmond, get the capital city. The Confederacy was going to rely on what we call a war of attrition. Ironically, this is what the Union will wind up using at the end of the war. 
But the, the idea of the war of attrition is that you just try to wear down the other side by inflicting as much continuous loss in them as you can. You just try to kill them and kill them and kill them and kill them until they're exhausted or they run out of supplies or they run out of men and that you, you're still standing at the end of it. They would prepare and wait. And when the union attacked, they would kill as many as they could. The weapons were also modified during the time of the Civil War. There, there were some big changes between the American Revolution and the Civil War. Um, number one was the type of ammunition that they used. So during the time of the American Revolution, they would have a ball-shaped bullet. And the problem with that is when you shoot the bullet, it's going to be it's going to go through the air and the the more surface that you have the more facial surface that you have against the air the more it's going to cause the ball to slow down because the air is hitting it face on and also throw it off track it it won't stay in a, in a straight line so because of that they created something called the bullet the bullet shaped ammunition and with the point here it's more aerodynamic so as you shoot it the air hits it and will go around it. It's like a, how a lot of cars are built these days, very aerodynamic. The, the air goes around it, it cuts through the air easier. It can hit its target from a greater distance um, because there's less wind resistance. Also, they started to um, carve grooves into the barrel of the gun. This is called rifling. And what that would do is because the grooves in the, in the barrel um, would cause the bullet to spin, as it was coming out, it would act like a drill. It would drill through the air and give them more accuracy. The things that were shot from cannons were also going through a little bit of a, a change also. So back in the, in the American Revolution, a lot of times the cannonballs were more um, just solid. Some of them did have some explosives in them, but as time went on, they created these shells which looked like big bullets and they would fill them up with different things. So you had a canister, you had the solid shot, you had the shrapnel shell and so on. So when these things exploded, it would send off large pieces of metal all over the place. It would act like, um, like, like a thousand bullets firing off in every direction. Same thing with the canister shot. You fill it up with metal. When it explodes, all of these pieces of metal fly all over the place. You can do massive damage. Um, literally can cut a person into pieces. These weapons would, would cause more casualties than seen during the American Revolution. So the war is between the North and the South or the Union versus the Confederacy. But the war was also divided between the Eastern Theater and what we call the Western Theater. So the Eastern Theater was mainly the battles between DC and Richmond that we found in most of Virginia. As you go out here, a lot of it's going to happen along the Ohio and the Tennessee and the Mississippi rivers. These are where the gunboats and the troops are used, uh, especially by a guy named Ulysses S. Grant, who's going to become very famous uh, for all this, the fighting that he does there. In the West, Ulysses S. Grant was preparing troops and gunboats to take over the Mississippi River. This is what a typical gunboat would look like. And you can see that it's, it's different than a normal ship because it's more flat. It's like a raft. Um, because the rivers could be shallow. Gunboats were like floating forts with guns. Grant first of all targeted Fort Henry and Fort Donelson on the Tennessee River. So you can see Fort Donelson here and Fort Henry here. And again, using a combination of the gunboats and the troops um, going after these forts, most of the time these forts are going to be up on a hill of some kind. So the strategy had to be you know, a little bit different. Uh, but taking out these forts was good for the Union because now you could use the Tennessee River going towards the Mississippi without worrying about being shot at. Both forts surrendered after getting shelled by the gunboats. Grant then marched towards Mississippi, but he stopped at a place called Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee to wait for more troops to support him. He knew that he couldn't move on and defeat the Confederates in front of him without some support. The problem with this is that they were surprised by Confederate troops at Shiloh Church and, pushed, and they were pushed back to the river. Grant's men at this point advised that he surrender. 
but he insisted on attacking the next day. This is where we start to see the person that Grant was. There aren't many people that would have made that decision probably. Um, outnumbered, your back's pushed up against a river so there's nowhere to go. Um, the troops that are supposed to get there haven't gotten there yet, and yet you plan on attacking the enemy the next day. So some people would call that foolhardy, some people would call it courageous. Um, it really depends on how the battle comes out. So the next question to ask also is, even if you do win, how many people did you lose getting that win? And that was something else that Grant took into consideration. He was not afraid to have his men die. The way that he looked at it was, we're in a war and people are going to die. You can't act afraid, you, you can't act passive. So even though he was advised by his own men that they should surrender, he insisted on attacking the next day, which he did. The Battle of Shiloh was gonna be one of the worst battles of the Civil War. Fortunately for him, uh, and Providence was on his side for sure, the troops he was waiting for arrived overnight and the Union troops won the battle. The battlefield was over six miles long. The Union lost 13,000 casualties. Now keep in mind that the population of Uxbridge is right around 11 or 12,000. So the Union just in that one battle, that one day, lost 13,000 casualties. The Confederacy lost 11,000. It was the single bloodiest battle of the war. And after that, Grant just moved on to Memphis. At the same time that that was happening, if we go down to the south here, Admiral David Farragut had the, uh, had the Union Navy and he took some gunboats and, and went up the mouth of the Mississippi River, past New Orleans, past Baton Rouge, and took each of these cities as he went along. So the idea is if Farragut can move south and go along the Mississippi towards the north, and if Grant can keep winning up here and move south towards Farragut, they could close off the Mississippi River together. So Admiral David Farragut was using the US Navy to move up the Mississippi River. They took New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Natchez, Mississippi. So we're gonna stop this video here. There's so much material that we're gonna break it up into a series of them. So we'll end video one here, and we'll pick up with the, uh, the Eastern Battle of the Merrimack and the Monitor. Uh, and we'll go all the way to the Battle of Antietam, which may be one of the most pivotal battles uh, ever, if not just the Civil War.